I think if you say out there, I'm a man or a woman is the most controversial thing today in America. Or as a matter of fact, some of the countries that you will not find something more controversial than that. There's been a huge cultural change that has taken place in the last few decades. Same-sex marriage would have been unthinkable 30 years ago. Now it's universally accepted. Gender reveal parties that are still there happening with the husband and wife biting into a cupcake to reveal the sex of the child is now scorned upon. Now the transgender issue is the next big social, ethical, and cultural issue that has come to dominate the headlines. I mean, there's hardly a week that goes by without something on the news there, some transgender story, and stories just keep coming. Pope Francis has given his approval to same-sex civil unions getting a support for legal recognition of same-sex relationships. Governor Newsom of California signed into law a bill, AB 2218, which establishes the Transgender Wellness and Equity Fund. This fund aims to provide medical treatment for transgender individuals, including children seeking to transition to a different gender. Now, do you think it stops with Newsom? Listen to a televised town hall meeting, a mother asked President Biden about reversing policies that negatively impacted LGBTQ plus individuals, specifically mentioning a transgender daughter. And this is what President Biden mentioned. He responded by expressing his commitment to changing laws and eliminating discriminatory, discriminatory executive orders. He emphasized the importance of supporting the decisions of young transgender individuals and advocated against discrimination. Additionally, President Biden recently proclaimed March 31st as Transgender Day of Visibility further highlighting his support for transgender community. Still want to vote for him? That's what we often think, right, of the world out there. Um, how, can, how can we stand for something like that? Well, I don't speak on those, you know, but sometimes when you read and hear these kind of things, you, see, you just can't be quiet. Take, for instance, the case of Chastity Bono who was born in 1969 as a daughter of Sony and Cher Bono. At the age of 40, Chastity underwent gender reassignment surgery and adopted the name, you know that? Chas. Reflecting on their experience, Chas Bono expressed the belief that gender resides in one's mind rather than solely in their physical attributes. According to Chas, Gender encompasses how a person feels about themselves, while sex pertains to their biological characteristics. Chas suggested that for individuals, gender and sex align harmoniously. But for transgender individuals, there exists a discrepancy between the two. Chas characterized this incongruity as a simple mix-up, or listen what said, birth defect, similar to a cleft palate, a birth defect. So we got to understand ourselves in the light of God's word, in the light of all the things that's happening around us. What does God's word say? The Bible treats our identity in theological, and in fact, it's even relevant today in modern times. He gives us a body, 
and he brings us into the world. And his gift of a body tells us who we are. No confusion. A body reveals who we are. A boy or a girl. A man or a woman. And to understand all this, the Bible is our reference point. Because if we lose our reference point, then we are in confusion. So we need to have the Bible as our reference point. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. You see, recognize that the Bible is authored by the Holy Spirit, right? 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be approved unto all good work. It's sufficient. The word of God is sufficient. The Bible is wholly true, completely true, in all that it teaches, in everything that the Bible teaches, the Bible is completely true. And you can see that in Psalm 19, verse 7. Psalm 19, verse 7. Reads, the law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure or assured. Making wise the simple. So it's only true in all that it teaches. Also, the Bible is completely sufficient as we read in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. You may want to wet your fingers. Because... 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Him. So everything pertaining to life and godliness is there for us. So it is through the study of scriptures that we can discover the divine mind and the divine design. Right? So we need to know the divine mind. And in order to understand the divine design... We need to go into the Word of God. So let's begin here. And if you have your outline there, you can kind of follow along. God created man in his own image. Image and likeness. It's a Hebrew word, Salem. And likeness, the word demut. Both image and likeness are interchangeable. Three times in Genesis chapter 1. God created man and woman, it said, in his own image. You see that in verses 26 and 27. And if you have your ballpoint, your pen, or whatever you're using, you can circle that or highlight it. Then God said, let us make man in our, what? Amen. Image. After our likeness. So image is Selim, after our likeness, Demut. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock. And over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. The Bible clear on that? Yes. Male and female, he created them. He created them. So if you see three times, you have the word image there. Image of God. Now God created male and female doesn't mean God is both male and female. Because the Bible addresses God as what? A father. God the father. You don't hear God the mother. Uh, God, you don't hear that. Uh, we are made in the image of God. And nothing can alter that reality. Nothing. So when God breathed into man the breath of life. Nefesh, he, he fashioned man out of the dust, and he breathed into man the breath of life, and there you see the image of God. Now, what does that look like? It could culminate into a different things, his, his attributes, his characteristics, emotions, spiritual. There can be a little bit of relationship as there's a relationship within the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in relationship with each other. 
It can be a little bit of his function as in he has created us to be in dominion, his representative over all the face of the earth. So it can mean different things. But primarily, we know that he was created and we have seen attributes of his, his in us. So when they see us, they see us in the image of God. I was talking about it uh, yesterday, um, wondering why God has said in Exodus, you shall not make any image, any graven image, right? On, on the face of the earth, anywhere outside. Why? Because we are in the image of God. There's no other image needed. So God created male and female. We are made in God's image. Nothing can alter that reality. And by the way, the image does not wax and wane. Today you have a better image and t tomorrow you have low. Oh, you sin, boom, blew it, image is gone. No, image is always constant. It doesn't wax and wane. God's image doesn't change. It does not rise and fall. As we become smarter, our image grows. And as we become dull, the image drops. No. Man is the image and the glory of God made first by the Lord. I mean, no one else shares the image of God other than human beings. Not even the squirrel running up the tree or the fly on the wall or anything else shares the image of God. It is just you and I see, sitting here. Every single person living on this universe, human being, is created in the image of God. That should give us an opportunity to share the gospel with people because we are talking to someone else who is made in the image of God. When you hurt someone, when you're angry with someone, when you're bitter towards someone, you are being bitter, angry, hurting someone made in the image of God. Culminates in a lot of things. We'll see that in a moment. The woman shares the full image-bearing status with him. Man is the image and the glory of God, and the woman, along with him, shares the full image. With me, turn with me to First Corinthians. First Corinthians. Chapter eleven. Verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7. For man ought not to cover his head. Why? Since he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. So woman shares the full image-bearing status with him. And so we are made in the image of God. That means he has stamped us as spiritual creatures. We are in the image of God. We live in the realm of the earth, but God created us to transcend our surroundings. We are not like the animals around us. We are not like this podium here, or the desk, or the table, or the chair you're sitting on. That's pantheism. We are distinct from all these things around us, and we transcend our surroundings because we are made in the image of God. God made two sexes at the start. Two sexes. What are they? Male. Speak to me. Male, Male and female. female. Man and woman. Where do you see that? Go back to the Bible. I don't want to say it. Let's see what the Bible says. I know we've read this and again and again. But Genesis 1, 27. Very clear, right? Very clear. 27 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So it's a creative work of God. And there are men and women because God desired that there be men and women that would bear his image. God didn't desire lion and lionesses. God desired men and women to bear the image of God. So if you're in some state and you have someone walking around like a cat or a fox, 
as their gender, thinking that they are a cat or a fox. No, God didn't create them. God created them as man and woman. So we are the embodiment of his glory. <clears throat> so having created man and woman, God had plans for man and woman. Plans. So you're building the foundation here, right? Because if our foundation is not right, there's no point trying to understand all the other things of what it means to be cisgender and transgender and, and binary and bisexual and androphilia and agender and all those kind of things. doesn't make sense. By the way, there's no need wasting our time understanding those terms. If you realize Facebook, you know how many identifications of gender it has? It's almost 50 plus. 50 plus, what's your gender? 50 definitions or, or characteristics or whatever you want to choose from. So, let's come back here. Let's come back. So God had plans for man and one woman. Let's see what his plans are. And we see that in Genesis 128. Genesis 128. And God blessed them. Isn't that wonderful? Has he blessed us too? Yeah. As he created man and woman, he blessed them. And what did God say to them? Be fruitful and multiply. That means God wants man to create a family. The first duty was a direct call, go procreate. Have children. Have children. You're not here for yourself. Oftentimes when... You know, couples get married and, and, and we just want to build a castle for ourselves. Children, will think about children later. Well, we were created to have a family. And the first duty is a direct call to procreate. You're not here for yourself. Make lots of children. Make lots of little people in the image of God, right? That's what it says. Go multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. And what's the next thing out there? Verse 28. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Fill the earth. And subdue it. God is not concerned or paranoid of diminishing resources. world is not going to run out of strawberries. Strawberries gets over, you'll have more strawberry crop coming in. There's plenty of resources. God didn't say, oops, I'm out of control now. In a few years, we're going to run out of blah, blah, blah. No. God created us and resources are available for us. Don't buy into the lie that resources are diminishing, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't take care of. You ask a farmer and they'll tell you how to take care of the land. And they take care of the land. If you want to know what to be, how to be steward of the land, the farmer will teach you that. So we're not talking about that. We're talking that God's not paranoid. So children are a blessing and a heritage from the Lord. Uh, see, um, turn with me to Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Verse 3. Psalm 127. Verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, a what? A reward. You see, listen, beloved, the earth was made for humanity. Earth was made for humanity. And so we got a free fruitful, we multiply and we have dominion over all things. Dominion means you subdue and take over the land. Take dominion over the earth. Rule over the created order. And stewardship and shaping is all part of it. So have dominion over all things. And so come back to 27. Genesis 1:27, And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created 
him male and female. He created them, and God blessed them, right? He blessed them. And then he gave them this mandate, fruitful, multiply, subdue, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and every living thing that moves on the earth. He didn't make us a tree hugger, okay? And he gave us the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and all those things. And we've been told to have dominion over them. But he blessed them. That means he gave both man and woman his special favor, his special favor. That means all creation carried the smell and the look of a divine designer. Nothing was fallen and nothing was out of place. We see that in creation. Everything was good. And then God created man and woman with bodies, hands, feet, Right? Eyes, ears, nose, hair. Some lose it before others. Some lose it from the front, some from the back. But we were all created <coughs> and designed with bodies, bodies that can be joined together in sexual union. In sexual union. So there is a complementarity, a physical complementarity between a man and a woman. God made these distinct um, persons so that man and woman could join together in sexual union. You've seen um, those wooden tiles that you play on the floors. And there is... A male and a female. And slide one into the other. And it stays on the floor. Complementary. It's there. Designed like that. You have electrical circuits. You have a male and a female. Did you know that you cannot join two females together? You cannot join two males together? I tried that once. <laughs> that shows how silly I am. For Christmas lights. Because I started my lights in the wrong direction. And my plug was on the other end. And so with my engineering mind, I thought, well, I can just find something. And I didn't realize, you know, think about it. And I go into Home Depot and I have a conversation with a guy out there. and said, I need a connection. And it's, no, sir, you can't get it. It's not legally permitted. And immediately it went to my mind. Oh, but you can allow a male and a male to get married, and a female and a female to get married. This, well, anyway, that's a different story. You see, man and woman are both needed to have children. You cannot have produced children without the other. And so they have a distinct calling, a role, a duty, ability. They were joined, they were designed to join together in sexual union. So sexes were not made for battle. I remember the battle of the sexes. No, sexes were not made for battle. They were made for one another. Amen? Not for seeing who is more powerful. We were made for one another. Let's go to male and female identity. In Genesis chapter 2, Adam was made from the dust of the ground. And we see that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man, right, of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the nefesh, the breath of life, and man became a living creature. So God is crafting man here. Crafting man. Creation is waiting for man. And God's crafting man as he made him from dust of the ground. And Lord placed Adam in Eden to work and to keep it. Look at chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. 
You see, it was not perfect, right? Because he had to keep it. I wonder what was involved in that. He had to take care of the garden. He had to be a good steward of the garden. And by the way, you find serpent coming into the garden. So he had to take care of it. He had to keep it. Protect the garden. Work in the garden. This was his divine commission. There was his divine order. Man should work. This is God's divine theological blueprint. Man must work, not sit and sip lemonade all day. Man must work, not play video games all day. Man must work, not play golf all day. Sorry, I'm going to get into trouble for this. Man must work. He was made for work. Work not as a result of the fall. Work preceded the fall. Why? Because God is a working God. And man will find great joy in working for God, working unto God. So work is not a result of the fall. So a working God makes a working man. And man must watch over the garden. And man must keep it. Man must steward the garden. The garden is to be kept well. Adam must pay attention to the garden. He must keep his eyes open. Protect the garden. And not only protect the garden, because now he's going to bring someone into his life. And he has to now protect his Eve from now on as well. He must not fail to fight off threats. So look at verse 17 of chapter 2. You're with me? We're getting the basics. We are laying the foundation. Chapter 2, verse 17. Here's the Lord, 16. The Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but there's something you must not eat. Not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So let me read that again. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not touch it, nor shall you eat it. Mm -hmm. I'll say it again. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not touch it, nor shall you eat it. I uh, skipped over something or added something? I added something. What did I add? That's what Satan added. I'm not Satan. <laughs> That's what Satan added. All right? And you will see that later on. Then you'll see that later on. This means Adam must obey the Lord. Right? He must obey the Lord. He must keep his charge. He must keep the covenant or else he will suffer the consequences of disobedience. And the fact that Adam is alone doesn't seem good to the Lord. Missing something. My Adam is alone. Chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him. A person who will, after coming to life, decide whether that person should be a man or a woman and be a helper fit for a man. Is that what it says? No. <laughs> That's not what it says. It says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And so what did he do? Look at verse 19. He, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was, by the way, man is naming each of the animals. And then, verse 20, the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heaven and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So, what did the Lord do? He 
drops man into a deep sleep by God's design. A kind of anesthesia that could knock a horse off. Took a rib out of his side. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And as soon as he saw the man, he looked at her, and he was overjoyed. And he set his eyes on his wife. And look at what he said. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And so every time Adam looked at Eve, he reminded, she, she reminded him that I came out of your body. And every time Eve looked at Adam, she would think, he gave his body for me. He gave his body for me. That's the dynamic here between man and woman. The woman is called by God to respect and trust the man. Adam is overjoyed. As he set his eyes on the woman, and you see the plan for the rest of humanity unfold. Look at verse 24 and 25, chapter 2. The plan for the rest of humanity. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become what? One flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and were not ashamed. So that was a plan for the rest of humanity. The woman will soon become the mother of all living. So God made two sexes, male and female. Not a result of evolution that colleges lie to our kids today and have been lying for centuries that we have been created uh, out of an evolutionary trend uh, theory. War mannered and woman does not go back to chaos, randomness, or some gaseous appearance or happenstance or nothing of the sort. God designed man and woman in a dazzling display of wisdom and creativity. And he created a woman who is now going to be a helper, distinct from man, but going to be a helper to man. They were not the same. Man and woman are not the same. Man has over 1,000% more testosterone than woman. Complementarity is the fabric of marriage. You cannot produce life in a Petri dish. You cannot. Without recognizing this complementarity. God designed Eve to be filling the role of a helper. Eve brings strengths, gifts, abilities that man will benefit from that only she possesses. My wife compliments me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> she, okay. It's your opportunity, guys. <laughs> and I'm sure your wife does. And if I were to talk to you, you would say, praise God. God's brought her into my life. So he brings strengths, gifts, abilities that he will benefit from that only she possesses. Without Eve, man is impoverished. Without Eve. Man would be nothing. Without Eve, Adam will not be able to produce blessings. God created women to have value and they possess dignity. And without woman, there can be no human flourishing. No civilization without either one of them. You need both. And Eve is the mother of all living. And you see that godly woman 
train their daughters to see this role and recognize this role from the start. They teach them to be in this role all the way from the start. Sexes, my friend, are not designed for competition. They are made for cooperation. They're not designed for competition. They're designed for cooperation. So the man, when he saw the woman, cried out, This is at last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. He recognizes that she fits him, compliments him, gladdens him. They're rejoicing together. She's going to help him. And together, they're going to produce children. Together. The body fitted for the woman. A woman fitted for the man. No need for any bodily change. Any need for any bodily change? Perfect as God created them. And under the leadership of man, she will assist him in filling and subduing the earth. I'm not saying that. This is what the Bible says. Under his leadership. You see, he begets, but she alone can give birth, right? She alone can nurse, right? No one else can do that. I was reading a story of a, a girl who became a man and then wanted to deliver babies. I stopped, stopped reading it. <laughs> Gender roles after sin. So what happened? Such a perfect environment. What happened? Let's go into chapter 3. Hanging in there, everybody? Good? Genesis chapter 3. Something happens. Sin enters the world. Sin enters the world. Satan takes the identity of a serpent and urges Adam and Eve to disobey God. Adam should have protected his wife and rebuked the serpent. But instead, what does he do? He stands passive. And he hides instead of leading and protecting his wife. The bell rang in the middle of the night. The guy got up and looked at the time. It was like 1.30 in the morning. Hun, can you go look who is at the door? <laughs> Don't raise your hands. <laughs> But that's what he has done. That's what he did. He stands passively. The beast takes dominion of mankind. And then Eve leads Adam. Do you see that? The beast takes the dominion of mankind. And then Eve is now leading Adam. When Adam was supposed to be leading Eve. Role reversal. There's a, the order of creation is reversed. There's inversion of authority and death enters the world. And by the way, think about this. If you think about the first man Adam and the second man Adam, Christ, the first man Adam desired to be like God. And he sinned. The second man Adam was God. And Philippians 2 says, he humbled himself, becoming like man. What a contrast. So the order of creation is reversed. And there's inversion of authority and death enters the world. The Lord visits the man and the woman. Look at Genesis 3, 9. Genesis 3, 9. But the Lord called to the man. And said to him, where are you? Where are you? And by the way, the you there in the Hebrew is singular. So whom is God calling out to? Adam. Adam. Not where are y'all? No. <laughs> where are you? By the way, I don't know if the y'all is plural. 
Adam blames the woman. And God himself for this, right? Isn't that what he said? The woman you gave me. Yeah. He's not taking responsibility for the evil. He allowed evil to enter the house. He refuses to take responsibility for that. There's blame shifting. The first blame shifting in the Bible. Right? What are you saying? You look. Right? That's what he did. And so what happened? The Lord curses Satan and the woman. And actually the man as well. Look at Genesis 3, 15 through 19. 15 to 19. Love it. This is the grand story. This is a story you got to tell your children. You got to rehearse the story with them. You got to help them understand because they are in a world of confusion. They go into these schools out there, the government aided schools, and they just brainwash them and confuse them. And I'll tell you that they have removed all kinds of understanding to us sex, male, female, biologically, I understand that. Gender is, yes, I'm a male, I'm a female. But no, 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 now they have made a dichotomy between sex and gender. Sex is who you are, but gender is what you think you are. That's what they teach on college campuses. That's what they teach in the public schools. And so here, we find here that um, Adam is blaming the woman and God himself for this. The man is not taking responsibility for the evil that is allowed to enter their homes. It's blame shifting. And the Lord curses Satan and the woman in Genesis 3, 15 through 19. So let's look at that curse. I'll put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The woman does not become a child bearer as a result of the curse. No. no. That was its original plan, right? You're fruitful and multiply. What happened as a result of the curse was the pain that was going to be associated with childbearing. Man does not become a worker as a result of the fall. God already designed man to be a worker in the Garden of Eden before the fall. The curse just reversed that in the sense now brought pain and toil into the process. So, so the creation is cursed. But the design still stands. Nothing happened to the design. God created Adam and Eve for fruit, being fruitful and multiplying, right? The only fact is the curse came into the world, and now as she is being fruitful and she is multiplying, every child she is going to give birth, she is going to give birth in what? Pain. The man is going to conquer the world and is going to, multi and is going to be a good steward of the earth and the garden, but every time he tills and he tills and he tills, weeds pop up. He removes it, goes to bed. Next day, oops, where did it come from? Well, that's a result of the curse. So you find here that there is the physical effect of the curse. So the man will navigate great hardship in working the ground. He's going to encounter difficulty, discomfort, eventually becomes dust as he dies. Look at Genesis 3, 17 and 18. But to Adam he said, because you listen to the voice of your wife. <laughs> Somebody's not getting dinner tonight. <laughs> By the way, I'm glad there's dinner served here. <laughs> if you miss that, I'll read it again. <laughs> it was not God's voice. Trust me. And did you hear the voice of God? <laughs> and to Adam he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain 
You shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust. And to dust you shall return. Now death enters the scene. The man called his wife's name Eve. Because she was the mother of all living. And by the way, we missed the curse of the woman. Look at verse 16. To the woman he said, I'll surely multiply your pain and childbearing. Child In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Bad, bad thing. Not desire as in he's going to love the woman all the more. I mean, the woman is going to love or the man all the more. His desire is the same desire that you find in Cain and Abel's desire for sin. That means she is going to usurp his authority. So you're going to have woman usurping the authority of man because man is supposed to be the leader. The woman is usurping that authority. That's part of the curse. Part of the curse. And from then on, nagging entered the world. <laughs> Did I say that? No. <laughs> Who said we can't have fun, right? Having a Bible study doesn't mean we got to be serious. We can have some fun. Okay. Guys, everything is... <laughs> So fallen man and woman will now use their bodies and their lives to dishonor God. And they will do so by rejecting God's wiring of their bodies. Their male and female relationships and their male and female identities. And they will deny the creator. They will reject that sex has a certain meaning and purpose. They will reject that. And they will say that man is a tabula rasa. You know what tabula rasa is? Yeah. A blank slate. That man is born with a blank slate. And as he's born with a blank slate, you and I must now create our identity. Whoa, 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 whoa. God's already given us our identity. You don't create your own identity. You don't write your own story. God's already written your story. That's what we've been reading all this while. But we, they say, they teach. That's what schools teach. That's what colleges teach. That you're born with a blank slate. And you write your own story. Man will reject creator order. And seek to make their own neo-pagan order. No longer God's order. Fathers and mothers are now called by the generic term. What? Parents. Oh, parents can now mean what? Father and father, a mother and mother. Uh, young men wear the clothes and adopt the hairstyle of young women, right? Young women wear the clothes and adopt the hairstyle of young men. And sometimes as you stand and look, you wonder whether that person is a male or a female. And you've lost all concept of that in the world today. So how does the culture view gender? If you're following along in the outline, we have next point there. And I'm going to stop with this and we'll pick it up next week. I'm going to give some opportunity for you to ask questions. How does the culture view gender? Well, relativism. When you think about relativism, relativism permeates the mindset of individuals today. It asserts that meaning and truth are subjective. Meaning what is right for one person may be wrong for another person. Perhaps you encountered these kind of words, uh, phrases. You can't dictate my actions. You heard that? You can't tell me what to do and what not to do. Children? Does that sound familiar? 
That's not right. That's relativism. In other words, I can do what I want to do. You don't want to tell me. Absolute truth doesn't exist anymore. That works for you, not for me. We hear that. Common expressions like, I'm glad you're happy about that. You live your truth, I'll live my truth. And so relativism has been embraced. And the phrases embody a non-judgmental ethic. Exemplifying how relativism shapes contemporary thinking. And I'm going to show you a video right after I state this of an interview on a college campus. Relativism rejects the notion of a single correct way to comprehend the world. Instead, it acknowledges the existence of various narratives out there. You know, it could be Islam, it could be Judaism, it could be Christianity, it could be Buddhism. They're all different paths, and different individuals choose to follow some of those paths. None of them hold absolute truth. You just approach life, and you take it, and whatever you find joy in, use it, adopt it, as long as you're happy. Relativism. I want you to watch this uh, three-minute, four-minute segment of a campus. Um, go ahead. There's been a lot of talk about identity lately, but how far does it go? And is it possible to be wrong? We went to the University of Washington to find out. Are you aware of the debate happening in Washington State around um, the ability to access bathrooms, locker rooms, spas based on gender identity and gender expression? I, I think people should be able to have access to the facility. I think uh, bathrooms could and potentially should be gender neutral because there doesn't need to be a classification for differences. I think people definitely should have the ability to go into whichever locker room they want. Uh, I feel like at least public universities should do their best to accommodate for those who do not have a specific uh, gender identity. You know, whether you identify as male or female and whether your sex at birth is matching to that, you should be able to utilize the resources. So if I told you that I was a woman, what would your response be? Good for you. Okay. Like, <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you. I'll be like, what? <laughs> really? I don't have a problem with it. I'd ask you how you came to that conclusion. If I told you that I was Chinese, what would your response be? I mean, I might be a little surprised, but I would say, good for you. Like, yeah, be who you are. <laughs> I would maybe think you had some Chinese ancestor. I would ask you how you someone came to that conclusion and why you came to that conclusion. Um, I would have a lot of questions just because on the outside, I would assume that you're a white man. If I told you that I was seven years old, what would your response be? Um, I wouldn't believe that immediately. Uh, I probably wouldn't believe it, but I mean, I, it wouldn't really bother me that much to go out of my way and tell you no, you're wrong. I'd just be like, oh, okay, he wants to say he's seven years old. If you feel seven at heart, then, <laughs> then so be it. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> so if I wanted to enroll in a first grade class, do you think I should be allowed to? Uh, probably not, I guess. I mean, unless you haven't completed first grade up to this point and for some reason you need to do that now. If that's where you feel like mentally you should be, then I feel like there are communities that would accept you for that. I would say so long as you're not hindering society and you're not causing harm to other people, I feel like that should be an okay thing. If I told you I'm six feet, five inches, what would you say? That I would question. Why? <laughs> because you're not. <laughs> no, I don't think you're six five. If you truly believed you're six five, I don't think it's harmful. I think it's fine if you believe that. It doesn't matter to me if you think you're taller than you are. <laughs> so you'd be willing to tell me I'm wrong? I wouldn't tell you you're wrong. No, but I say that um, I don't think that you are. I feel like that's not my place as like another human to say someone is wrong or to draw lines or boundaries. No, I mean, I wouldn't just go like, oh, you're wrong. Like, that's wrong to believe in it. Because, I mean, again, it doesn't really bother me what you want to think about your height or anything. 
So I can be a Chinese woman. You. <laughs> um. Sure. But I can't be a six foot five Chinese woman. Yes. If you thoroughly debated me or explained why you felt out that you were six foot five, uh, I feel like I would be very open to saying that you were six foot five or Chinese or woman. It shouldn't be hard to tell a 5'9 white guy that he's not a 6'5 Chinese woman. But cl clearly it is. Why? What does that say about our culture? And what does that say about our ability to answer the questions that actually are difficult? All right. Thank you. Will you see the fallacy there? as long as it is not harmful to anyone. Right. Harmful has become an individual subject to relative term. No one knows what is harm. If I do something on my own, it is definitely going to harm other people. It is going to definitely harm other people, and we will see that in the coming days. Uh, we are living uh, in a realm of relativism post-Christendom where moral truths espoused by Christianity are gradually losing their impact with each passing year. Christianity is diminishing, decline in church attendance, an increasing lack of familiarity with the Bible. Bible literacy is kind of down among many individuals. Uh, value systems and ethical frameworks that are not more Christian morals uh, or against Christian moralities is the norm today. Christ society has accepted widely same-sex relationships, declining marriage rates and rising divorce rates and people living together instead of marriage. I mean, all these social changes are only possible within a context where Christian perspectives on the world are viewed as optional, irrelevant, or increasingly hateful and bigoted. So we are kind of in a post-Christendom culture. Radical individualism. Individualism asserts that individuals have the authority to shape their own lives, which aligns with the principles of relativism. It upholds the idea that an individual's desire and preferences are of utmost importance and it is deemed inappropriate to criticize or label someone's choices or beliefs as wrong or immoral. You saw that? Our culture promotes the notion that living authentically and true to oneself is essential for personal fulfillment while disregarding this can potentially lead to harm. So you hear things like this in our culture today, in our homes today. Mom, this is the only way I can be happy. So what is that child saying? I'm not concerned about your happiness. I'm just concerned about what? My happiness. As opposed to ancient times where it was the, the family, the society, the relatives, the extended family. Oh, I did something. My uncles, my aunts, my grandma, my grandfather. I'm concerned about their joy and their comfort and their happiness. Today, it's all about as long as I'm happy. Very individualistic. Focuses on personal well-being. Not on what benefits the people around us. The sexual revolution today, if it feels good, do it. Challenging conservative views on sexuality, a freedom to engage in sexual activities according to our desires, and I talked about this when I preached a sermon on biblical sexuality a year ago. Christian ideals of sexual immorality in the past, anytime you had sex, you had the fear of pregnancy, risk of pregnancy, but that's no longer the case. 
The shift has significant implications for how society understands the purpose of sex today, eradicating the assumption that sex should exclusively occur within marriage. The idea that sex outside of marriage is morally wrong has been overturned. And so you have people having sex outside of marriage, having babies, and nothing said about it. And the legalization of abortion, 1973, particularly in the United States, detached the act of having sex from the responsibility of giving birth, removing societal stigma around the issue. Sex is meant to be between well, let me reinsert something there between a man and a woman who are married to each other, not just between a man. Just be having sex between a man and a woman doesn't make it right. It is only allowed between a man and a woman who are married to each other. And then another thing is Gnosticism. We know what Gnosticism means. The body is evil, spirit is good. That's corrupt into today. The true self is distinct from our physical form. That our bodies are inferior and so can be modified, shaped, or altered to align with our personal feelings. And that's a form of Gnosis. So yes, your body is there. You can change it, tweak it, do whatever you want, as long as it is aligned with what you think you are. So the idea that gender can differ from one's biological sex is a contemporary manifestation of this ancient Gnostic concept. And so as a result, what has happened? Gender has been redefined. Gender has been redefined, and we'll stop with this. In the field of psychology, the term gender identity is defined by American Psychological Association, APA, as an individual's internal sense of being male, female, or something different. Transgender is a broad term encompassing various ways in which individuals may perceive their gender identity to be incongruent with their biological sex. Previously, the DSM manual, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, categorizes experience as gender identity disorder. But in 2013, the DSM-5 replaced the classification with the term gender dysphoria. So now it's no longer a condition, it is something that you think differently. And we'll pick this up more as we come back next week. Questions before we stop. Keep your outlines with you and so you can bring it back next week. Any questions as we stop here? Any comments? Yes. Um, for this Bible study, it's also, um, is it also discussing on why like progressive Christians are leading in um, these issues? And if we view progressive Christians as Christians, oh. that's a different, yeah. I would see them as Christians because they have gone off the gamut of mainline Christianity. It has to be biblical. It has to be from scriptures. The Saint Jude Bank issue with the preaching of pastors that are marrying these same-sex people. So yeah. They're no longer what it should be in Christianity. Yeah. I mean, it's God's design. So the question is, what happens to preachers, pastors who marry same-sex people? Keep in mind that today in Christianity, there's a whole gamut of so-called people who call themselves Christians. If you know, there are side A Christians and side B Christians. Have you heard about that? Yeah. Side A Christians are Christians who say that you, it's perfect to be in a homosexual relationship as long as it's a one relation, one man, one man, a one woman, one woman relationship, not multiple partners. Side A Christians, a monogamous same-sex relationship. Side A Christians. They call themselves Christians. And then there are side B Christians who say, 
well, it's the way I'm wired. And so I could be in an emotional, romantic relationship, but I'm not in a sexual relationship with the other person. So in other words, they're still in a same-sex romantic relationship without getting involved in sex. Side B Christians. Baloney. There is no such thing. Yeah. Well, how did God make us? The scriptures, that's why we went through Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. And so it's an opportunity for us to go deep into Genesis 1, 2, and 3 and help them understand this is how you were designed. Now, God doesn't make mistakes. And the work that God has done cannot be undone. This is who God made us to be. So, but there are uh, sometimes, uh, what do you call intersex, uh, where because of sin, right, because of the fall, which has affected a lot of things around us, that even sometimes babies are born, sadly, with both chromosomes. No, 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 let me, let me correct myself. Not both chromosomes, with sexual organs. Yes. Well, there are different names for it. I'm not getting into all the details here, but the only way you can find out is going with the chromosome. So you go into the body and test the genetic chromosome. If it's an XX, it's a female. If it's an XY, it's a male. So whatever they have on the outside, if the chromosome says XY, God designed them to be what? Male. That's because of this flaw, fallen human sin. That's the effect of sin, sadly. Genes are corrupt. So you always go back. Now, the only complication comes if you go into the chromosome level and there is an XXY. Now you have a problem. Now you got real. There, there, there's people born like that too. Um, and so, sadly, that's the effect of sin. And let's, and all, let's, so if you start opening up the whole discussion, you can talk more. We are getting into, we're just scratching the surface not getting into all the details of it. But I want us to understand the scriptures and what the scripture says. And that is man designed man and woman. It was not left to us for choice. If at all you take nothing else from this, you just go out and say, yes, I'm a man and my gender is a man. I don't have to think that I'm a man. Or I'm, I don't have to think, well, and we'll have some Q&As and we'll pick up some um, things that parents have encountered with their kids. So we'll talk about that at a later time.